Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hello, explorers. I'm Pam Larikia, and it's the 30th of August, 2022, as I record this intro. And this week, we're revisiting a popular compilation episode from last year. Many people have asked me whether any former or current teachers have been interviewed on the podcast. And the answer to that question is a big yes. We have had more than 20 podcast episodes featuring guests who were or are teachers or university professors, who study education, or even who teach education courses. Does it seem like a strange leap to make from being a teacher to being an unschooler? To me, choosing teaching indicates an interest in children and in learning. So to dive into that even more deeply with their own children through unschooling seems like a rather natural next step to take. So this episode contains snippets from six teachers turned unschoolers sharing about their journey. It is inspiring to hear from them, especially during this frenzied back-to-school season. And if you're interested in listening to more episodes with teachers turned unschoolers, follow the link in the show notes to check out the reference page on my website for all the episode numbers. And before we dive in, I want to take a quick moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support the podcast through Patreon. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Your generous support is instrumental in keeping the podcast archive freely available to anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now please enjoy this compilation of stories from teachers turned unschoolers. So how did you discover unschooling and how did your family's choice to move to unschooling come about? Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like our process was, you know, you can always go back and see the stirrings of where it started once you're way far ahead. But, um, But I actually, well, I have a teaching credential. I did teach, um, and, but I really got into teaching through like wilderness education and experiential education. So I was always kind of more interested in the alternative forms of education. Um, and I didn't have a lot of exposure to homeschooling when I was like in college and stuff. But I, I remember there was one young woman who, um, I met through other programs we were doing and, you know, she talked about rollerblading for PE and she was just such a cool person. I was like, Oh my God, that's awesome. <laughs> um, then I don't know if that ever planted a seed, but, um, so I, I did teach in the first time I got into like kind of a real classroom. I remember thinking, I will never send my kids to school. I just, I felt so inadequate as a teacher for these kids. I felt like the way that I put together stuff and I felt like I was, could relate to them really well, but the way that I had to try and it it just felt like just getting through the day. That's what it felt like. I just felt like I was doing them such a disservice. It didn't matter how much I connected with them. I just thought I, this is terrible. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and so when, and so I, I got pregnant with Raylan when I was teaching at a charter school and I was like, yeah, I, I don't know what we're going to do, but I, I don't want to send her to school. And then of course, you know, you have kids. Um, and, and I remember thinking about homeschooling because I was so, you know, just amazed at the way that she engaged with the world and the way she would ask questions about numbers and adding things when, you know, when she was little, I thought, Oh my God, why, why would anybody put her in a math class? Like she just <laughs> is curious about numbers. Like I, I saw all of that, but I, it was funny. I never took the extra step of being like, well, let's figure out homeschooling. Um, and I think because I had had a big Waldorf influence from somebody who was important in my life and there was a Waldorf school here. And so we started doing some of that early childhood education stuff. And, um, and so we kind of got started on that track, but we moved from a town, um, here in Maine that was a little bit more a small town, but 
more in town up to a rural property, which is where we are now. And I kind of had to make the decision then because she was going to be in first grade. If we were going to homeschool, we were going to put her in the local school. And by that time, Liam had been born and he had been in the Waldorf early childhood program. And we just thought it's a local school. We could walk to school through the woods. It was a K through eight, like one classroom. And it just felt like it had enough sweet features that we would try it. And it was fine. Like she did really well. She didn't have any complaints. And then Liam started kindergarten. But at all of that time, I was also starting to go to school for homeopathy. And, um, and, and I mean, I'll say more about this later, but you know, it's such an individualized approach to healing that I think there was starting to stir something in my brain that like, I'm doing this career that's about individuals. And yet, I'm sending my kids to this place every day where it's not about the individual, really. It's about keeping them with the group. And I had a friend through my book group who unschooled her boys. And we had always gone over to the houses and I thought, oh, my God, it's so chaotic. (laughs) But it was like, you know, they were in the yard and they were in the house and it was like art and like bringing pans of dirt in to put on the stove. And what happens if you cook the dirt? And it was I was like, oh, my God. But but my son was friends with her boys and. One summer we went over there and her, one of her sons is really into digging and excavating in the yard. And he had dug this huge hole and then he wanted to build a fire in the hole and make a chimney to kind of explore the whole idea of a chimney and airflow. And so I'm not kidding for two hours, my son and her boys played with fire safely in this hole. And it was all, they were experimenting and what happens if we cover the hole and what happens if we put newspaper in and what, and I just sat there and I was like, Oh my God, he never gets to do this. Like, yeah. and it's not that we wouldn't allow that at all. It's just that between going to school every day and, you know, like how, trying to like recover on vacations and camps in summer, I thought, Oh my God, the kid's six and he doesn't have this kind of like full experimentation, like open-ended playtime anymore. And I went home and I just said to my husband, I was like, I think we need to think about pulling the kids out of school. And, and so we talked about it, just him and I, and I talked about like my work and how I felt like it was kind of hypocritical to be sending them to do this. Well, I was trying to help people individually, but I wasn't putting the time into my own kids. And, and at the same time, he was shifting his work as well into like coaching in the business world and also like helping individuals and helping teams out, you know, to thrive within a system based on what they needed. So we were kind of moving in this direction and it just felt like we can't have our kids be doing this thing that feels antithetical to what we're putting our passions into as a career. So we posed it to the kids, you know, they were not complaining about school. They weren't asking to leave. There weren't any problems. And, um, they were like, yeah, yeah, we're interested. And so we said, well, let's, let's keep checking in through the fall and then we'll see how it is at the end of the semester. And I remember we went in for like their final teacher, um, conferences and my daughter was in fifth grade and we kept wanting to hear like, you know, how does she enjoy certain things and what kind of questions does she, you know, just about her in the classroom. And she kept going back to the test scores. Mm -hmm. And then in my son's um, conference, the teacher was like, oh, he's great, blah, blah, blah. But then she said, well, you know, there was this incident where she and he and another boy came in and they were kind of wanting to play a practical joke or they were doing something that was a little cheeky in the classroom, kind of causing her problems. She said, you know, and I, I told them I wasn't going to tell their parents if they didn't, you know, if they, if they didn't do this again. She said, but, you know, I just want to let you know. And my husband and I were like, we never, ever want you to pit us against our son. Like, Mm -hmm. please don't do that. Don't, don't ever say you're not going to tell us. Like, we don't have that kind of relationship with our kids. We want to know what's happening. Like, we're not going to punish him. Like, I think she thought that like we would be punishing him at home or something. So it was like this kind of manipulative back channel. We just walked out of there and we're like, we're done. (laughs) This isn't (laughs) this anymore. And so, yeah, so Christmas, um, it was Christmas break and they didn't go back. It's so interesting how their choice to offer their kids to stay home came, not from their kids, but from her and her partner's growing discomfort. And the kids jumped at the opportunity to not go back. Next, we'll hear from Grace Colma. Grace shares how she became disillusioned with the conventional school system and chose to leave teaching behind. 
Well, let's step back a little bit then in your mm. journey, because um, you had mentioned that you had studied uh, primary school teaching at university and had taught for a year. So I was hoping you could chat with us about what you discovered about children and learning through that experience. Yeah. Oh, I yeah, so much. Um, so I guess just to, to sort of start off with it for a bit of a picture of it all, um, I come from a family of teachers. Um, my dad taught for 20 years and he was an amazing teacher. Uh, he actually taught me at one stage in his class um, in, the, in sixth grade. So uh, I guess I saw how he was as a teacher. He was that sort of wild um, sort of to serve with love type teacher, um, just to name one archetype, but you know, all of those kind of <laughs> Robin Williams style teachers that you get in the films. Um, yeah. yeah, just really inspiring and outside the box. And, um, I, I saw myself as someone who loved learning and loved to see children learn. And I didn't have any kids of my own. So I, at that point I was only 19 or something. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I thought I'd study teaching and, 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 pursue that passion. Um, but I was, yeah, very quickly disillusioned with all of it really, even just in university alone. Um, just with the way that education was presented to us as, um, just being something that you tick off the list, um, a whole lot of rules and regulations, a whole lot of exams and tests, like teachers were taught to be able to, to assess children. Um, and just the way that my lecturers taught us about things was just hip hypocritical. You know, they'd be teaching us about engaging students and they'd be doing it from the front of a lecture theater with black and white slides and would be sending us all to sleep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they hadn't set foot in a classroom in 25 years, probably. Um, they were very academic and um, it just didn't feel like the love of learning that I'd experienced and that I wanted to to share, I guess. Um, so I, I sort of stuck it out for the four years and I did some of my practicums in schools and I had some really interesting teachers, let's put it that way, as my <laughs> mentors. Uh, <laughs> they would, I, I sort of seemed to always land the assistant principal. So the person that was kind of the level of a principal in terms of responsibility, but still in the classroom, mm -hmm. uh, which meant that they were constantly out of the classroom and just using me as their as their casual teacher to teach and um and they were really jaded and the way they spoke about their students was just yeah I don't know I, it just didn't put a lot of confidence in me that they really were there to see their children their students thrive um and let me just carry this by saying that I'm not at all against teachers you know I I have been one I know how hard many of them work I just happen to to see a few of the the ones that probably should have retired. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that was all pretty um, pretty interesting for me and, and I really was starting to lose all hope in the in the education system but I gave it a, a year and um, I did some teaching and I actually got my own class in my first year out, a year, a year four class, so like nine or ten-year-olds in Australia. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the school that I was in was um, a really different experience again. It was in Western Sydney um, a, a lot of different cultures in, in Western Sydney, you know, kids from all over the world. Um, and I just, I basically got told on the first day that I had been given the hardest school in the class, in the hardest class in the school. Um, uh -huh. so that was a great way to start my career, <laughs> um, just with that knowledge. And, oh, I threw myself into it. I, I told myself that it didn't matter and I, and I would love the kids anyway. And, and many of them were, were gorgeous kids, but, I just, the system wasn't supporting me and I was doing my best and I, I had kids that were just really violent, to be honest, um, just came from a really violent upbringing or had seen a lot of uh, violence with their, um, a lot of them had older teenage cousins or, or, or brothers and sisters that were out in the streets and um, yeah, that they brought that into the classroom and I felt unsafe. I felt like I couldn't keep the kids safe. I was in the middle of like a lesson that I prepared and thrown my heart and soul into. And I really wanted to see the kids have those amazing moments where they, they understood things, they learned things, they learned to love um, a particular subject. And uh, I would be constantly interrupted by a child tra strangling another child. Um, just stuff wow. that you, is just really, um, it shouldn't be on any teacher, but let alone a first year out teacher. Um, yeah. So I stuck it out, but I, I, I was slowly being broken down by it. Um, and I, I, I guess the hardest thing beyond seeing the violence of the kids was seeing the kids that didn't think that they could do it, who had been told because of the grading systems, because of the assessment and the standards that they weren't meeting, that they were 
they'd been sort of told a message that they were stupid. Um, and these kids didn't think they could do things. And I, and I would always be wanting to see these students sort of discover that they could. And I remember mm-hmm. vividly sitting with one girl who uh, she had, she was in grade four, as I said, but she had, had been told that she had the reading level of a grade one child. And so she just never thought she could do anything with reading and we were sitting there reading together and she had this amazing breakthrough and she discovered something about words and connecting the dots and it all made sense and her eyes just lit up and I was in that moment with her thinking this is why I studied teaching you know I I love seeing that moment um which unschooling parents would get to see all the time of course um Mm -hmm. and being the nature of the one-on-one or one-on-two sort of interactions and and I saw that with her and then in the in the split second that I saw it I was pulled away I was called in to manage another fight happening across the classroom because I'd been focusing on her and the rest of the class had gone crazy and that was that was that was sort of the end of my of my patience with that I just thought I can't do this anymore it's not for me I need I need to be able to invest in children on, on a much smaller ratio. One to 30 doesn't work. Um, so I think it's, it's not the fault of the teacher often. It's the fault of a, of a faulty system. Um, so that was sort of my journey with that. And, um, and, and I guess I, I learned through that about learning that it can't be boxed in. It can't be scheduled. It can't be time limited. Um, otherwise, children become either disengaged or if they if they think that they're academic, if they've been told by their parents that they're an academic child, you you see those sort of children memorizing, um, mm-hmm. rote learning. They're not truly taking anything in. It's you know what is the quality of learning if it's not sticking with you, if it has no purpose. You know I really started to consider those things. Um, yeah, so there yeah, we go. That's <laughs> quite the experience. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, that that's. I really like the point, well, a couple of points there, but um, one thing that, that has really stood out for me lately is um, how how much, you, you know, they're not even really negative messages, but it's just, you know, you're not just from, from, your, from your grades and, you know, the impression that that kids get that they're not good at this or or they're not good at that and and how that really stifles them ever even trying it soon after right oh yeah definitely the the love of learning is is so quickly squashed when you add you put a test in at the end of something um and I think that's even true for adults you know so Mm -hmm. it's not only kids that this relates to I think all of us want to just learn and enjoy the process of learning and not be you know, tested every single time. I love Grace's focus on cultivating a child's love of learning and how the system can really get in the way of that. And next, we're going to hear from Sarah Peshek about her journey from teacher to unschooling parent. I would love to know how you discovered unschooling and chose to follow that path. Sure. So, um, my daughter went, my oldest daughter, Rosa, went to kindergarten and first grade and um, I used to be a, I'm a former school teacher. So with the year that she was in first grade, I was working at a different school. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, in the spring, I was really trying to figure out what I was going to do with her for the next year. Because um, if I stayed at the school where I was teaching, it was a private school and she could come there and be there. Or she could stay at the public school where she'd gone to kindergarten and first grade. And I spent, I don't know, a month going back and forth and I would decide one thing and then something would happen and I'd be like, I can't do that thing. Yeah. I can't bring her here to this place that I'm working. You know, I just, that's just not going to work. And then like she's going to stay at her school and then something would happen there. And I'd say, Oh, I just don't think she can stay there, you know, and back and forth and back and forth. And, um, and then there was this day where at, at work, my work, I had a, a mom emailing me about her son and he wasn't, getting the grades that she expected him to get. And it kind of hit me that I didn't have an, any answer I could give her that I felt good about, about why that was. Because he was a super smart kid, super fun. And it just, I don't know, it was almost just this moment where I was like, I am taking part in doing all these things that I don't feel right, that aren't, you know. And, and a lot of teachers are doing a lot of great things, but I'm doing, expecting these kids to do things that 
aren't in their best interest. And I'm just having to, because of the system, I'm having to do things that I just don't think are right. And I don't think I can keep doing that. And um, I came home and my daughter said to me, she got home from for first grade and she said some kid had made fun of her Tinkerbell shoes and told her she was a baby for liking Tinkerbell. And she's six years old. And I was just like, it was all on the same day. And I was just like, you know what? What if we do so, you know, I, what if we do something totally different? What if we homeschool? And it was like, as soon as I had that thought, all of the stress I'd been having and going back and forth just like disappeared. It was just like, yes, that is the thing to do. That is what's going to work. And let's try, let's just try it. My husband said, sure. And so um, that was kind of, it was, it was a very distinctive day when I decided to bring her home. Um, we finished out that school year um, because you know, I was under contract and all of that, but, but I knew that, that in the fall, it was not, we, she wasn't going to go back. Um, and then we started with a school, you know, a very schooly at home approach. And because I was a teacher, so that was, you know, we were kind of going to do the thing, you know, do all the things and it was going to be great. And it did not take me long to see that it was not, that was also not going to work. <laughs> um, that, it, that I mean, I tried and tried and tried tweaking things sort of all fall. Um, and it was just not, <laughs> it was not clicking and I could see it. You know, I had my kids right in front of me and I could see that the time that I was spending trying to get them to do my ideas of lessons, the things that I thought were important, it, it was not, that, that, that goal that I brought into well, well let's t keep her home where learning can really happen was not happening she was she was trying to do as little as she could to kind of get by and please me and I was just sort of less like what you know I was sort of lost for a while you know and I just kept I just kept plugging away and just kept plugging away and um I I sort of because of then some some stressors that were coming into our relationship, I started sort of reading a little bit more about a peaceful parenting approach. And this idea of sort of being a partner, a, a coach, and not, not being sort of coercive with the kids. And, and it all sort of it all kind of went together there to kind of help me develop then all sort of at once. But I, but the, um, the idea of, of the learning kind of it just was looking at what was happening and seeing that it wasn't, that it wasn't clicking and, um, and seeing the contrast in when she was doing what really was bringing her joy and lighting her up. And I could see that that's where the learning was. And so, you know, it, it was really just following her that led me to see, okay, I think this unschooling idea that seems really crazy at first, there's really something there and I need to dig a little deeper to find out what that is. Sarah's observation that when her daughter was doing the things that she wanted to do that brought her joy, there was so much learning happening. That just resonates so deeply with what I've seen and so many unschooling parents see because that is unschooling in action. Now let's hear from Marcella O'Brien. She was a fifth grade teacher before having children. So I would love to hear a bit about how you discovered unschooling and what your family's move to unschooling looked like. Okay. Um, well, I, um, my background is education. I uh, was a public school teacher and um, I taught fifth grade until Sean was a baby. I worked one year when he was a baby and then I stayed home. And that both the plan was for him to go to school. Um, but as he got, well, that, as he got closer, I started to, I don't know, question a little bit him going to school, but I was, and I was also going to the Leche League um, meetings because then Jack was born. And so I was picking up books around there and I picked up a book, an unschooling book. I think it was the unschooling handbook. Um, and I read that and it just, I thought this makes so much sense. And it was also fitting with what I was seeing with Sean that he was just learning all the time. You know, I, I wasn't, teach you know he was just learning and growing and I realized oh yeah that does continue just having just thinking about the students that I taught too um how they had their interests you know and they were learning and growing um and I started to question also the negative parts that I saw when I was teaching and realizing that they were interfering with the learning like the forced um, mm -hmm. assignments and all that and also that we were shifting in Virginia 
to the, uh, the standardized tests, the SOLs were getting more serious. I mean, I guess it's happened all across the country. But that was kind of, I was hearing from, from other people I knew who were teaching that it was, school didn't look the same as it did when we were in school or even when I was first teaching. Um, and so I, yeah, so I just, I loved it. I loved the idea of unschooling. I talked to Chris about it and he was not too crazy about it. He wasn't too crazy about homeschooling but especially not unschooling. Um, but he, he was like, he said, okay, okay, you know, if that's what you want to do. So we, we did it. And it was, um, the first few years were, it was all fine. And, um, and then I think, I mean, every, you know, the, through kindergarten, first grade, because I feel like at that point, you really, I think if you're unschooling or if, if your kids are in school, it's kind of, you can't see that much of a difference. I mean, there, I actually thought Sean was learning way more at home and in unschooling than he would have been in the classroom. Then when he was around eight, I started getting nervous because he was um, not, I was thinking in my school mind of what a, like a second grader did and that he wasn't doing those things on his own. Like he wasn't sitting down and doing math, of course, but you know, he wasn't writing, you know, he wasn't doing those things. So I started to think, oh no, well now I'm, now I'm hurting him. You know, now he's, now he's falling behind him. So I, kind of panicked and tried to get him to do some school stuff and that did not go well I mean it was like a month or so and it I mean it was really bad and he I mean he had like violent tantrums I mean there was other behavior stuff going on then too but then I don't know it kind of it came to this head where where Chris and I had to look at it and say what well, something we're doing is not going well and um so we we just kind of stepped back and looked at everything and I I joined the shine with unschooling list and everyone there was such a big help and um, I read a bunch every book they recommended and everyone recommended and we realized oh well it was our our expectations um, the way we were parenting and also the, the school I mean everything is kind of like he hit eight and I was like okay you need to act like this you need to be learning these things and he was just reacting to all that and acting yeah. out and and he said at one point he's he said I'm I'm, my life is 75% bad. So he was like giving us messages that he was kind of getting depressed and, and, and acting out and lashing out. And so, we, um, so then we, we came together after reading all the books and, and decided, you know, we said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take pressure off. We're going to really be unschoolers. And that's kind of when I thought, okay, now, now I'm, I'm, I'm unschooling. Before I was kind of like, not really doing it. I don't know. I, I wasn't considering myself an unschooler, but at that point, yeah, it's like, okay, we're doing this and we're going to get support from each other. And um, I had some friends here too, that were going through the same, some of the same stuff with their kids, actually. There were three other families. And so the moms, we would all get together every week. The kids would play and we would get together and we'd read books and we'd talk and just support each other. And it was so great. So, so we've been unschooling ever since. It's so interesting to hear her distinction between not going to school and embracing unschooling because unschooling isn't just about not doing school. There's the whole piece of what we're replacing that with, things like curiosity and support and connection. Next, let's hear from Meltha Delmore, who wanted to be a teacher from an early age and loved working at a high school. So I'm curious how you actually discovered unschooling in there and whether or not you felt that your days changed as your son reached school age. Yeah, it was kind of a long journey for me. And it, um, there was a lot of judgment um, on my end towards homeschoolers even. My background is secondary education. So my plan from an early age, like, sixth or seventh grade was to teach high school English. Yeah. Um, and I went to college and I, I loved my education classes. I love my English classes. Um, I'm a book. I just could spend days in the books. Um, and I worked, um, at a high school and loved it. Um, part -time. and then I had a kid and even at the high school, there was um, a posture of like, those homeschoolers are such like, what idiots, like, why would they homeschool their kids? I can teach them to write a great essay. Like, why would they think they could do that better? Um, to the point that 
even my husband who wasn't really pro or against homeschooling would be like, what is your deal? Chill out. And I was like, they're just like, why would they do that? Um, and then I had Max and I was suddenly like, why would I send him to school? Like, why would I send him to preschool? He doesn't want to leave me. He's three years old. Um, like, why would I send him to teachers who don't even know him for three to six hours a day? Um, and then he got towards school age and I was like, why, why would we like send him away for eight hours a day? Um, which my husband and I still laugh about because <laughs> of how it started out. Um, and during that time, I also met a homeschool family and I knew the kids before I knew that they were homeschooled and I loved the kids and the way they interacted with us as adults was distinctly different than other kids. And so I was a bit blown away to realize they were homeschooled because homeschooled because it was so different than what I had been picturing. Mm -hmm. And um, that was probably a step in my journey as well. And so when I brought up, I guess my son was about three or four to my husband, um, the possibility of homeschooling. And he was totally on board with it. He kind of goes with the flow in a lot of ways. Um, although he's, yeah, he was just like, karma coming back to bite ya. Um, <laughs> you. Know. But um, so I started looking at homeschooling and I read about all the different kinds of ways to educate your, your kiddo or a lot of them at least. And I was like, so I'm going to homeschool, but those unschoolers are super weird. I'm never doing that. Um, and so I met with a family. I, I, the first family I knew was doing classical curriculum CC. And so I was like, well, this sounds fabulous. And I met with them and I was like, wow, it's really intense academically. There's so much memorization, like how neat. And then when I thought about doing it with my son, I was like, this will never work. Like there will be so much conflict if I try and teach him this way. Mm -hmm. And so then I was like, well, maybe let's look into the Montessori method. And so I did a lot of research and I was like, this is perfect. And I met with a, a woman who was um, homeschooling her kids with the Montessori method. And she was talking about her day and the different methods and how they looked. And I was like, ooh, I'm not sure this is all going to work. So I went back to the drawing board and I was like, Waldorf, that's it. It's outside. It's in nature. Like, this will be perfect. And then I met with a woman who was doing Waldorf with her family, actually a woman and her husband. And as we went through what that looked like for them to really keep with the Waldorf methodology, I again was like, there's going to be con like, I'm good. There's going to be struggle. Um, just knowing who Max is. Um, and I finally just kind of tumbled into the unschooling realm and I was shocked that all the things I learned in my education classes about how human beings learn melded beautifully with the unschooling philosophy that when humans are, um, that when we're engaged and when we're interested, that there's just deep learning that can take place and all the things that I would try to make happen in my classroom in a 50 minute time period, trying to get the engagement, trying to get the interest so that like learning could take root and interest could be sparked was just the life of the unschoolers. Her story about meeting up with various families with different homeschooling approaches and looking at them through the eyes of her child is fascinating and wonderful. Her observation that all the things she had learned in her education classes about how human beings learn melds beautifully with unschooling makes so much sense. And finally, I have a longer clip from a conversation I had with Daniela Bramwell about finding unschooling. Her perspective is so unique that I wanted to share this section in full. Growing up, she attended a Montessori free school. Then she went to university and eventually became driven in her self-described quest for, quote, the best education. She's finishing her PhD in education and society right now. And she does a great job in our conversation, weaving together these various threads of her experiences and describing how unschooling has become her learning lifestyle of choice now that she has her own child. And I, you mentioned your uh, interest in education, and that's what we're going to deep dive into <laughs> today, which I think will be really, really interesting. I'm, I'm excited to learn some more about it, but I think it'll be really interesting for people listening. So um, to start with, 
Let's let's start there. Let's start with um, growing up because you went to an alternative Montessori free school growing up. So I thought we could start there and you could maybe you could share a bit about that experience. Okay. Um, I think I'll start a little bit before that, though, because it also ties into the story. (laughs) Uh, So in terms of kind of like schooling or education, um, uh, my parents, so my mom said I went to a kind of nursery school or something in England where I was born. And then when I was four or five, we moved to Canada. And then and, and my parents had already read this book about this school called Pestalozzi in Ecuador. And so it's the kind of Montessori free style school that you just mentioned. So the Pestalozzi was, um, anyway, based on different kind of progressive ideas about education, but mostly I guess free school is a good description for it. So they had read that book and they loved it, but that was Ecuador in South America and they were in England and their family was in Canada. They were from Canada. So they went back to Canada and they started looking for kind of like alternative schools. <laughs> and so we were uh, in Ottawa uh-huh. and um, my mom said that I went to, I think it was five different schools, but I don't remember all of them because <laughs> they were kind of trying out these schools. Um, I do remember one that my mom said they were supposed to be alternative, but uh, the only thing that was alternative about it was that we had this kind of break where we all, and that I do remember, we went to this large gym and we were supposed to lie on a mat and they had us do like meditation or yoga for a few minutes. <laughs> but I think that was the only thing that was alternative about it. The rest of it <laughs> you know, regular curriculum and classroom work and things. Um, And then they didn't like any of the options. And so they tried homeschooling for a few months or something. I don't remember that either, (laughs) but they said it didn't, they didn't, it didn't work for them. They didn't, they didn't uh, like it. Um, But I think they hadn't found unschooling. They were trying to somehow get curriculum in, but it was me and uh, my sister, three years younger, and my sister, five years younger, who was kind of a baby toddler. My mom had her hands really full. Mm-hmm. And so my dad said he would come back from work really stressed and angry and try and teach me stuff. <laughs> and he said, that's the reason I'm kind of freaked out with math, but I don't remember that either. <laughs> <laughs> and then the school that I do remember was the last one right before we moved to Ecuador. And that's uh, a kind of public school. Well, it's, it was a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. but in Ontario they're Catholic public schools anyway so I remember going there and I remember I don't remember that much but I do remember one thing that I really liked the teacher had a a kind of game where each week a student brought in a big jar of something so I I think I really liked it because there was candy in it a lot of times (laughs) and we were all supposed to guess like how many how many items there were in it so like 214 and then at the end of the week we'd count it all out and see how many there actually were And the one who was closest to the guest, I think, got the contents of the jar or something like that. I remember things like that, snippets. Um, But I do remember a lot of other things that I think um, kind of, or or I don't know if I remember, but now I know that I learned a lot about competing Mm -hmm. and uh, kind of peer pressure and prizes, you know, and prizes and punishment for doing certain things. I remember in second grade, right before coming, there was some kind of math lesson but I remember so clearly because one of the children answered how he had resolved the math problem but instead of doing the sum he did the subtract the subtracting or uh anyway something like that and the teacher was so proud of him and saying like look what he did like he managed to solve it in this way and that's genius and you should all follow that and then gave him a prize because that teacher had set up a thing where he would give you points or tokens or something and at the end of the week you could buy something like a teddy bear or chocolate or something with those tokens and I remember being so jealous of that child and just like feeling like all this envy and like mean energy in me like why does he get the answer and why didn't I think of that and I don't know just a lot of kind of negative energy around um learning (laughs) yeah (laughs) I remember all of these little snippets and then kind of with all the things that I that I was reading kind of looking back and thinking okay so that really kind of the way I guess the the, the school I was in and also the surrounding culture that really um had a big influence in how 
like what I think of learning and how I was also interacting with peers once I got to that free school and, and with my siblings too, I just look back and I w there was a lot of competing. Like I always wanted to pick some game where I would try and win and that yeah. did not bring me a lot of friends <laughs> <laughs> nor a lot of happiness. <laughs> the, oh, the thinking of books, there's a, a really good book by Alfie Kahn called Competition or something like that. And when I read that, I was, oh wow, that yeah. just... Yeah. brings up so many things and helps me understand so many things but anyway I have these amazing amazing parents <laughs> who a lot of people are think are quite uh strange when they decided all of a sudden to move to South America to Ecuador with a three children under eight and one almost uh ready to be born I think my mom was seven or eight months pregnant I don't know six seven months pregnant <laughs> And they decided to move in February all the way to Ecuador. They have never, they had never been to Ecuador, but they just decided that that was enough with the Canadian traditional kind of school system. They needed something different. They were sick of the winter. I remember them saying that a lot. Like, wow, putting on snow suits for three girls and then they need the bathroom. <laughs> so they actually moved to Ecuador. <laughs> And that's why I grew up in Ecuador and they moved specifically mainly for uh, the free school for a different education for us, which is quite amazing. <laughs> so, so they moved to the, that area in Ecuador um, specifically near the school so that you guys could go there, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And, you know, I can understand wanting to escape winter, especially in February like that. <laughs> yes. After when I went to Canada as an adult, I was like, okay, I understand this. February is not good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness my birthday is <laughs> the only thing they get <laughs> I mean, February is great, but the winter is <laughs> hard. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so I remember uh, they told us, you know, we'd be going to this this what they asked us I think I'm saying like oh it's this school and you know and it has all of these things and they have rabbits and llamas and dogs and they have you know these amazing spaces and no winter and I remember we were trying to learn Spanish <laughs> and I knew un dos tres elefante because of that song of the elephant <laughs> sobre una tela de una araña I remember that's the only thing I knew about Spanish <laughs> On that kid's song <laughs> and my parents didn't speak Spanish either they think they took a month lesson that was it but my mom is French Canadian so they both spoke French too so I think that helped a little bit mm -hmm. um and we did too so anyway so we arrived here and uh the Pestalozzi school has no curriculum had it's closed now uh there was no curriculum there were no grades there were no marks there were no prizes there were no things that you had to learn by a certain age <laughs> and uh, it was a, a huge space they had an amazing space that they had built um all I'd say Waldorf style they never mentioned Wal Waldorf but later when I read it's like those ideas of like children need nature and things that are made of wood and like natural materials so they had this for their kindergarten area they had this huge building set up with like miniature chairs with like size for ch children under five with, made of wood and tables and like doll houses but all made of wood and like natural materials and a little kitchen and like a music area and a book area and this huge area with uh water and soap like to play with water and all these climbing structures and even like a carpenter area with all these different tools <laughs> that kids could use even two-year-olds like a hammer <laughs> and things like that um so just an amazing space and then for older children like kind of the same but more like functioning kitchen with with a gas burner from like six and up and knives and um like just a lot of trust in kids and like a carpentry area arts area lots of outside things and everything kind of with that um uh kind of like towards natural materials and also lots of Montessori material so like for math and for reading so there was like the math area with all these uh materials <laughs> um and and they organized all kinds of trips like to a factory and to the pool and they had all of these uh amazing things going on <laughs> so it was a really nice space um and 
lots of amazing things about the school. <laughs> yeah, so and you enjoyed your time there? Mostly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I um I had a really hard time making friends there so that was hard for me um and there were some things that I didn't enjoy <laughs> and some things that made me think like would I want Emma to go there and there were certain things that I was not sure about about that I agreed with and at first before kind of finding unschooling and reading about unschooling I kind of thought the problem was that there was there weren't any kind of classes there weren't any there wasn't a lot of structure so I remember like seeing the chemistry area and thinking like I'd love to learn about chemistry I have no idea where to start so there were some kids that would go in there and do experiments but I didn't know at all where to start and so I was just like I wish there was some kind of introduction or class or something that I could just join and somebody would guide me through the beginning steps or like I don't know, my dad would say like, oh, but haven't you heard this? Like, don't you know this thing about physics or about whatever? And I was like, no, where would I even start learning about that? So I, and when I wanted to go to the university, there was kind of a, it was difficult for me to, to do the entrance exams and I had to take all these classes before and I found the math so difficult. And I kind of thought that was because of the school, like the way that the school was set up that, they, that I wasn't prepared. Mm -hmm. But then I realized, uh, there were so many other students who were failing these tests too and had gone to regular schools. <laughs> and then, you know, I did so well in, in university. I just, I was the valedictorian. I got A's for every single class and all the teachers loved me because I was so interested in my learning and um, so interested in, I don't know, passionate about all these different classes. Um, so kind of later, <laughs> like at first I blamed the school and I'm like, uh, also, I thought like not not having friends and not fitting in socially, at least if it had been a classroom setting, I would have been part of the class, like I would have been part of the lessons and the, the, the outings and whatever. Um, but in that school, it was just, you know, everybody was doing their own thing and there, I wasn't necessarily part of any class anyway. So that's what I thought before reading all these things about unschooling. <laughs> And then it ch changed everything for me. I just thought, no, that's not the things that, that like the, the, the reasons that I thought, like that kind of drew me to studying education at university and just trying to figure out like what would be a, an ideal school for me. And I didn't have Emma then, but like what would, what would really work? Because I thought like I didn't find the Vista, um, that, that alternative school. There were lots of things that I thought didn't really work well, like kids not being able to read at age 14. And for me, that was like scandalous. Um, but <laughs> with no with no one with no kind of background for saying like, well, who cares if they don't read at 14? Like, what's the problem with that? But it was just like all of these kind of society messages, but without about like what was right and wrong with learning, but without really being to able to process it or like. I don't know, getting teased by kids who are not at the school, like, oh, you don't know multiplication tables, you don't know this, that, but with no kind of guidance of how to think about that or work through it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so no. I guess my, so, I, so when I read things of unschooling, like, oh, but you could tell your kids they could answer this way or that way. Like I think, oh, that kind of guidance would have been nice. I guess the adults in my life didn't know what to do in those yeah. situations. <laughs> That's going to be really interesting when we, when we get to the, to the unschooling piece, like, the, cause it's totally understandable, like from the way you describe that experience and how you were experiencing that school. And yeah. You know, like you, you weren't having those kind of conversations with your parents or with people at the school when you hear those external messages, right? About yeah, multiplication, like all that external stuff that that we hear because they're so predominant in society, right? Yeah, you get those messages and um, without being able to kind of process and and talk to people about that, um, and the way you were were the way you just were personally experiencing that school as in, you know, not again, no conversations about helping you how to engage with the chemistry area. Yeah. If that was interesting to you, you know, stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it, it's really understandable how you came out of that experience feeling like that wasn't uh, uh, 
helpful educational environment for you, right? Yeah. So then you were, and I, I love the piece too about how you were noticing, you know, when you were writing your entrance exams and that so many people were finding it challenging regardless of their background and where yeah. they were, right? Yeah. So, but this was your moment to lean into those and you, you know, as you said, you leaned in well, you did very well at university. And so I imagine, so was it that experience growing up with that school that got you interested in education? Because that's what you started. And we'll go right into the next question, basically, is that you became very interested in studying education. And like you mentioned, your master's and teaching courses and your PhD, um, so I, yeah, I'd be curious to, to learn you were trying to figure out what a good educational experience would be. So I think so. <laughs> I'm just thinking there's a few more pieces about the school, but I wasn't sure if I should mention them because I kind of thinking like ahead of, of when I kind of in the, uh, uh, sorry, in the order of questions further along, there's a question kind of like, like, how does it compare to unschooling or what's yeah, different yeah. from unschooling? So I'm kind of in my head, I'm in a muddle, like, oh, but I know I it's like for but, pieces for that question. Yeah, but did, what and did I, you know, I was trying to, I thought maybe we could talk about like where your headspace was at the time, right? Because at the time, you didn't know about unschooling. You hadn't heard right. about it. I didn't know. Yeah. Oh. So so a few more pieces like yeah. um, about the, the school and, and how I felt at the moment is that um, I felt also kind of frustrated because I wanted to take, for example, flute lessons or acting lessons or singing lessons or I wanted like to learn those things. And I guess maybe it was kind of my schoolish mind still from, from my Canadian experience that I wanted a class for those things. But also it was because uh, I wanted to meet new people. Like I felt like that was kind of like a specific group of people, but I wanted to meet new people, other people and go out into the world. And uh, also like, I remember asking one of the teachers like, oh, I really want to read music. And she kind of said, oh yeah, like this means this, this means this, now go off and learn it on your own. I was like, I need more than that. <laughs> that wasn't enough. <laughs> that wasn't enough. Like it gave me a clue, but it was like, okay, now what do I do? So I really wanted to go and learn all these things, uh, but that was not, not accepted in that school. So uh, there was a very big um, belief of non-directivity. I don't know that's not even in English, but <laughs> like not to direct uh, children. So like not interfere. I think they never said not interfere, but that was the kind of feeling of it. So it was like, and that was another thing that was looking back, I think, like something that was difficult for me, like you were supposed to play with the kids, like the adults were there to facilitate, but there was a lot of like, I won't interfere. So it's like, they, there wasn't a strong developing of relationships with us. It was more like a bit observing, like, oh, okay. So, oh, you need this thing. Okay. This is how it works. Or there was a lot of like boundaries. So we'll set these rules um and make sure that that you know nothing crazy happens like that was the role of the adults like to to make sure that, that nothing wrong happened or to help if someone got hurt or whatever um but not a lot of developing strong relationships and I think there was a lot of that thing of like not interfere so uh so like that you'd kind of get in the way of, of the kids learning or uh like direct too much and and interfere so so that was the thing like they really didn't encourage parents and like actively ask them not to put them in any classes uh not to get us in any classes because then we would be getting directive directed instruction like we like if I went to like a, a music lesson then I'd be told what to do and I'd be uh you know given a like traditional education and be you know like yeah. that, that's that's the word they use directing um but so so that it was a no <laughs> and uh, TV was a no and screens were a no and uh, computers were a no so anything like technology was also frowned upon and uh, that kind of rings a bell even now like in parenting groups like all the natural parenting groups like there's things that I agree with like attachment parenting but then screens are just like this evil thing that are gonna rot your brain <laughs> and so um, that was one of the main things that drew me to unschooling but anyway that's um, for later on but um, that was another thing. So I guess I felt like 
the world was a little small. Like there was that school yeah. and the people in that school. And that was it. Like there was no, no, nothing else. Like you couldn't go to any other classes or we didn't like, there was a, a few people I could meet in the neighborhood, but that was it. And there was no anything screen like, so no, <laughs> so no internet, no computers, no television. No. Uh, so I think those were two, two major things that uh, didn't, didn't <laughs> what? didn't sit, sit well, yeah, <laughs> didn't sit well with me. So those were kind of two other things I was thinking like, you know, like for Emma, like, but would I want that for her? Like that seems kind of uh, restrictive or I don't know, like closing the world instead of opening it. Mm -hmm. And and that message, like when, when you were talking about like um, what, uh, like what I was being told about like not knowing the multiplication tables, there was a lot of, and this kind of ties back to Rousseau, like his ideas about education, like that you should be stuck in nature and society is bad. They never talked about Rousseau as being part of their philosophy, but later when I read about Rousseau, I was like, wow, that sounds exactly like my school. Like, like uh, nature is good and children's innate um, inspiration is good, but society is corrupting. So we need to keep children away from that corrupting society. So there was a lot of messages like that, like, oh, you don't know your multiplication tables, but you know, those poor kids like in school, they're sitting at these desks and you know, they're learning all these things by rote memory, um, but they're not really learning them. And so there was a lot of talk with the adults of like, poor these people from this corrupting society and we're doing this wonderful thing. And also locations like the, I don't know, they're from the adults at the school, but also from my family, like, that we would be great. So there were all these stories about these great people like Mozart, who, you know, was wonderful without having gone to traditional school. So there was like this expectation that, you know, like we'd be doing these great things, but there wasn't, I felt like these expectations, but no real support. Like, I want to learn music. Yes, these are the notes. Go learn on your own. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I felt a lot of times. But other people from my school don't feel like that, but it was me. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is very unique at like to the person it is very individual the kind yeah. of environments that are that are supportive and yeah. so I think my kind of quest for the best education is also kind of silly in a way because it's not like there'll be one education that's perfect for for every single person it's more like what do different people need <laughs> so how did you find it when you were in um the university programs and right so I, I went education. to university to study um kind of like arts, multimedia animation actually. So like anime, drawing animated uh, characters and then bringing them to life in, in kind of video format. Uh, so, but it was a liberal arts school. So they had us do all kinds of courses like economics and math and I don't know, biology. There was like, there was a range of things that we had to uh, require. And so we had to meet to graduate. Um, and so I was always kind of curious about education courses because I had started to teach English as a second language when I was 16. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First as a way of making money and I was really scared to teach and then I found it really interesting like trying to think of all these games to make it more interesting for my students. Um, but I didn't like and then I started teaching in an institute but then it was it was really regimented so there was like this curriculum and they already wrote the test for you and you had to have the students do the test so there wasn't a lot of creativity on my part and I thought oh that's education I don't want to do that no way <laughs> so but then I took a class at university and they were talking about all these different theories so it's like reading about that bit of Rousseau and then I was like oh that's what it's like that's exactly like my school like for and so it's so exciting to me even now to read all of these different kind of education philosophies or views and try and understand them with the different schools I've been to I guess <laughs> Um, <laughs> so kind of reading about the, all of those things and um, so then I started getting really interested with those kind of courses like not with the mechanics that I had been doing at work or some of the classes were like you teach this way you evaluate this way and that I didn't like but I really liked learning about all these different education philosophies and also kind of like psychology and related to education like motivation <laughs> and things like that and then I guess I kind of thought so the best that didn't really work, I thought at the time, because there, there was no structure, there was no kind of uh, 
help or like the teachers weren't trying to motivate us like oh there's this chemistry thing do you want to see this experiment like there was no like inviting so then I got into all of these bits at university where it was like in all of the education theories and things I was reading about psychology it was kind of like oh um well the school structure kind of works like this like there's these things you have to do the whole coercion bit uh with the grades and everything but we don't like that so we're, we're going to kind of ignore it and we're going to talk about all these wonderful ways that teachers can motivate students to learn and present these ideas in these cool ways and all that so i really liked that for a long time <laughs> um but i but it also didn't really seem to be working like in it it didn't seem to make sense in other ways because for example We'd have all these cool ideas about like how to present something or how to engage students. But then there was these lessons on differentiated education, talking about all the ways that students are different, like all of their interests and their learning styles and the gender and their culture and maybe neurodiversity and all these things. And I was like, okay, so I'm gonna have, you know, 25 students that are completely different. So no matter how engaging I make the lesson, it's not gonna, work for all these students versions of it. <laughs> so now I need to do 25 different lessons this is not working either <laughs> so that's kind of a takeaway from my undergrad where I was just still confused like the face that doesn't seem to be the answer but this kind of traditional education even made amazing sounding doesn't seem to work either so <laughs> doesn't really work um and then for my master's and now PhD um I've been studying, I am still a student at OISE from the University of Toronto, and there the focus is on society, education and society. So it's a very different focus and also very interesting. So like, how does racism play out in schools and all these gender roles? And what happens, you know, if students are in this school that doesn't reflect their culture at all? And what's the relationship between culture and school? And all of these different, um, a, a very different lens from what I did in my undergraduate, which was, was mostly like classroom focus, like plan a good lesson and things like that. Um, really different focus and like reading historically, like how schools have been used for colonial purposes. Um, so all that, all of those kind of things. <laughs> well, yeah, no, that is very, very interesting because that bigger picture is, is so much a part of understanding understanding how that system tries to fit in there right it, yeah. it, does, it just, just gives you a bigger picture idea of of that and how much of it isn't really about the learning right how much of exactly it exactly <laughs> that's my grad graduate education has just opened up my mind so much about the different purposes of schooling that have nothing to do with learning yeah yeah no that's a nice great. way to sum it up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now we get to the super fun part. Let's pull all this together. <laughs> yeah, let me try and see if I can pull it all together. Yes, as in like, so all this, it, it's fascinating. It's really fascinating to me, like what your experience was um, growing up with, with in that school and the things that you found, the pieces that you found challenging and then how that um, it inspired you or, you know, had you thinking that almost I was going to say almost the opposite of it but yeah. you know just just more structure would have been more helpful and so now you're you're participating in that structure you're questioning it and then you're learning such interesting bits like that piece where you know it is very logical that learning is in the context of each individual and their experiences and and their styles and their, you know, who they are and where they are in that moment is what you need to connect to. So there, there is this kind of air gap between, yes, make it personal, make it interesting and, and, and kids love learning and you have to do it in this classroom with 25 kids. Like, you know, how, how do you bridge that, that gap? So that's super interesting. So how did you come across unschooling itself and what are the, <laughs> All those pieces that that kind of lit up for you that helped that made you think okay now unschooling is hitting these these particular pieces and that's what I would like to do with my family 
Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so what happened? I guess as soon as Emma was born, I started to change some of my thinking because um because of who she is and and the things and her strong very strong uh knowledge of her own needs and the things that she wanted um and not wanting to be you know kind of uh directed or or I don't know like not wanting me to be leaving to put, leaving her life or like telling her like this is good and this is wrong like she really knows what she needs uh, and and what she likes and and so that that's a big starting point <laughs> for me <laughs> of of wanting to um, to I don't know to meet to meet her and and not to try and be uh, in conflict of her with her all the time of like um, no actually this is good so you know this is the right thing so now I'm going to try and persuade you that this is the right thing and she's not having it and so maybe it's not the right thing like what's going on. <laughs> So a lot of uh, a lot of learning and everything, I, everything starts with her um, and, and me trying to uh, do the best I can by her. Uh, so I so I started reading a whole bunch of parenting books and everything. And uh, and and when I let's see, I was also in a bunch of Facebook groups and trying to figure things out because like the the kind of people that seemed to match with me like from what I was like attachment parenting like mm -hmm. people who were breastfeeding and co-sleeping but then they're all like anti-screens and anti-anything plastic and like only wooden toys and I was like oh, I'm not sure that I like that um but anyway so trying to find kind of authors that that resonated with me and then uh in one of the groups they mentioned podcasts which I'd never explored before and somebody mentioned what is it sage family Rachel Rainbolt mm -hmm. and so I scrolled through her um through her episodes and I saw Alfie Khan, an interview with Alfie Khan. And I had read Un Unconditional Parenting a bunch of times and, and started reading other books of his and I loved it. So I listened to that interview, but then she had other episodes on unschooling. And at first I heard, I thought that's crazy. <laughs> I don't like the sound of that, that can't work. That sounds too much like the things that I didn't like about my alternative school. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there was an episode on technology and there was an episode on math, like how, how people learn math. And it just, it was so interesting. I was just so amazed, like, oh, wow. Like the whole discussion on technology. I can't remember if I listened to that episode first or it was, I found, uh, there's an article, Lucy, I can never pronounce her name, her last name, I can read. Yeah, yeah. So she has an article about the 10 things that are worse for your child than an iPad or something, something like that. Yeah. And and so one of my conflicts with Emma, uh, starting very young, <laughs> like when she was about, I don't know, one and a half or two and Marco. So my fight with both of them was that screens were bad. So I, all my life screens were horrible. Like we didn't have them at home. They were going to rot your brain and like your eyes were going to die and your creativity was going to die. And, you know, you were exposed to consumerism and commercialism and sexism and oh my god all these horrible things <laughs> and Marco had none of those views and Emma loved watching um all kinds of things but especially I just remember the Snow White the Snow White videos that she loved she doesn't like princesses at all she doesn't care for Snow White but she loved the dwarfs <laughs> and and she and Marco would watch Snow White and would sing the songs and would dance and would play with the you know with the he found some little plastic figurines and would play out these amazing scenes and she was not even two uh but she was starting to make like she would make this voice for grumpy that was so amazing mm -hmm. <laughs> and like she was just kind of playing with that modulating her voice that she hadn't done before so tr just seeing her and they would draw snow white and they would you know everything and she would dress up and it was just a world of joy and of learning and I was missing out on all of it because I was like <laughs> it was just so funny to remember but I get like it's almost as if she was playing with a live snake or something like the screen would go on and my my whole body like I'd start like sweating and my heart would start racing I was like oh my god <laughs> So I would be like trying to get Marco to like turn it off, like, okay, but only 20 minutes. And like, you gotta turn it off. And like the pediatric association, blah, 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 says no screen before two and blah, blah. 
<laughs> I was traumatized by this thing. Um, but I could see all of the joy that they were getting out of it. And also myself, I loved watching videos. And once, you know, once I was away from uh, independent on my own, I spent a lot of time watching videos and all, a lot of learning on computers and everything. Ah, so it was all clashing in my mind. <laughs> um so then when I read Lucy's article and I listened to uh first it was Rachel uh, episode on podcast and then I found your podcast and then all of these different resources on unschooling and screens for lack of a better word technology whatever yeah. it just opened up such a an amazing world <laughs> and it just made so much sense and uh, the article of uh, Pam Sarushian on yeah. like the economics of restricting. And then I realized like, oh, wow, yeah. Like all my life, like how it had affected me to have, you know, uh, technology restricted and for food restricted and all these different things restricted and how that made or still, still makes me kind of the, I guess it's almost like a word of binge, like, oh, I'm not allowed, I'm not allowed, and I won't let myself do this bad thing, but if I do, then binge, like binge on, I don't know, a Netflix series, or binge on food, or binge on these things that are bad, uh, and so it just makes so much sense, <laughs> and so I started, you know, doing all this reading and listening, and then trying to get my emotions to catch up with my intellect, <laughs> because intellectually I can understand all of the reasons and and it just made so much sense but then emotionally like she'd be you know first hour okay second hour and then like oh my heart is racing she's been watching for two hours <laughs> I'm gonna die anyway no you so, really um, need those experiences like that one you can understand something intellectually but then you need enough experiences and, and observations. And it's like, it, it isn't a switch. It really is a time thing before you can really come to trust and know it. Like you feel it in your bones because, you know, you're having that emotional, that anxious reaction and everything. So it takes time to work through where you're not having that anymore so that's why the idea it took me a like, long time in your bones works for me yeah it is a physical thing isn't it it is it really is. <laughs> oh and it took me so long but um we never like even when I was like feeling in this panic mode I never I never I never ever said like I never said that's enough like I never said there's only one hour like we never said and we never made it had any rules or, or prohibitions around it but we did uh, like try and hide the ipad and interest her in other things or if she'd already been at it for two hours we'd like i'd take out like something that she really liked like beans <laughs> like lots and lots of beans like throw them around and toss them down the slide and like just playing with like things like that and so uh she'd often just kind of leave it there and come and play and then since she was distracted we kind of hide it um but then she started not working like she'd get angry that I was hiding it and anyway so there was a lot of kind of like like I knew that the reasons made sense but then I was like but she's too young like all these things that these unschooling people are talking about are for like the examples are seven-year-olds or you know older kids but Emma's just two and so you know, it's not right she's so young anyway a lot of working through that so there was a period when she um so when we really kind of said, okay, like we're just gonna leave the iPad there. And, and then when we moved to Quito, we have this big TV right in the middle of her playing area. <laughs> and this, that's the way it worked out with the spaces. So now like her space has this huge TV and then a big couch where she, you know, jumps on and lies on and has all her toys around it and the iPad and everything. So now it's just part of her, like it's one more toy. And now we're finally at a stage where it is one more toy, like for me and also for her, because there was this little period where when it was more available like she did spend a, a few a bit more time at it but um it quickly became just one more thing so some days she's interested some days she's not and it's just like any other toy mm -hmm. or tool in her environment <laughs> i imagine too as you were working through it she could even though you weren't setting specific rules she could probably yeah she can set your energy and, and yeah, the hiding sure. and stuff like that like she, yeah 
yeah even when we stopped the hiding and the stuff she was it was still a while I guess where she was like now what are they gonna do yeah, <laughs> now yeah. how are they gonna react <laughs> it's that time again it takes time for all of us to work through those different, yeah. different pieces so she basically that was time for her to develop trust again yeah that. Yeah, and and for me, I guess like when she was kind of rewatching the same things and was watching for two hours or whatever, uh, or three hours or who cares how long, but not like all day. Um, so I started to calm down. But then there was one time where I found this iPad game that I knew she would love because it had no like prizes or levels or winning. It's just like uh, little animated animals, which she loves, and you have them do different things in their environment. And so it's like role play on screen. Uh, I found that a few months ago and I gave it to her and she just loved it. And that day spent the whole day on it and I was starting to get panicky again. And I was like, ah, so I remembered um, one other article that I read from uh, Happiness is Here, Sarah, I can't remember her last name, but she was writing just like the Minecraft experience with her children that, you know, that they, they loved it for a few days and did nothing but and barely slept. And then the novelty was over. And she said, it's just like any other new thing. So I was thinking, yeah, it's like any other new thing. So Emma loves deep dives. Like she likes a book. She wants to read a hundred times. <laughs> that's, that's what she does with all the things that she loves. And so she did this deep dive and learned every single thing about that game. <laughs> well, you know, that's In like, we, we do that as adults. That's like kind of a human thing, right? That when yeah. we do something new and we're excited, we want to do it as much as possible until we kind of uh, gain that, that experience. Right. I mean, we, we want yeah. to be like, if I know it's it just book, all these I'm cultural sure. messages, like, yeah. Yeah. I do that all the time. It's just, I guess all these cultural messages, like, oh, it should be an hour a day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which makes no sense. But anyway, letting go of that too. <laughs> um, so that technology talk about is if a big part of, of, you know, from unschooling, you felt more, it made more sense to you versus the way you grew up. Like you put yeah. that in context when you started learning about unschooling and you started moving through. Um, Cause I imagine like as you're learning about it, you're putting that in the context of all your other experience, right? Your university and education experience and your experience of learning growing up. So what were um, some, some other, other, other pieces? Yeah. So some of the other things were, I guess like related to the screen thing just being open to the world instead of like trying to have like this protected environment where you know it was all wooden toys and whatever and all good rather than just kind of being open to the world and open to whatever it is that she likes or she wants or she needs rather than trying to have like these things that are good and these things that are bad so I really like that about unschooling um where I don't feel that there's like um you know, like nature is good and technology is bad or like the, the whole food thing, like this types of food and these are good and these types of food are bad or things like that. It's just ah, uh, so different, like just kind of, um, I guess I, I won't try and summarize <laughs> the unschooling view because everybody knows it or will learn about it in another place, but it was just so different from my experience growing up and so refreshing and felt so right to have these views about being open to the world and open to what children need and uh, like and want to explore. <laughs> uh, there's also other bits, like I was telling you in the alternative school, there was math, uh, not like taught in a sequence like in traditional schools, but there was like a specific area for math with specific Montessori materials for math. And like, there was this thing of like, you're not doing math, why aren't you going up to, you know, like, you should be doing at least a little bit. Like there wasn't a specific thing, but there was a little push. Um, and so what I really liked about all the things that I've listened to and learned about unschooling in relation to kind of math is just, it's really part of life. And so it's not like there's a specific area or there's specific materials or it's a different thing. Um, <laughs> so I just really like that view too. And just kind of thinking like, okay, that's a bit different from, from my alternative education so there was like three different so at first in my mind there were just two options like what you were saying it was like there was the alternative school where there was not really a lot of like engagement with adults or invitation or that many options and then there was this structured thing where there were like in, uh, like invitations or, but there was also a lot of coercion like you have to do it <laughs> and the grading thing but and all these other bits 
And so this third option just sounded so much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there was, there's also just I guess the main thing that we talk about in the network <laughs> the relationships and so what I was telling you about um kind of the alternative school and and the way that that the adults were kind of interacting was mainly as I said like you set up the environment and then kids are supposed to play with kids and you know you can interact with them a little bit but be careful not to interfere <laughs> and and so um, I see with Emma that she really, really seeks out adults and loves playing with adults rather than kids for now, at least. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I was the same, but that was frowned upon, you know? Yeah. Um, and just like the developing of a real relationship rather than the adult being like the provider of the environment. <laughs> there is such a huge difference between directing and supporting. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, it sounds like they were um, so uncomfortable with the idea of directing that they kind of stepped back from engaging and supporting like your your music. I'd like to learn how to read music example is perfect. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, they gave you a little, little tiny taste of it and then left you off to go and do it on your own because they didn't want to direct you. But in that engagement, in that relationship, there's just so many clues as to, you know, when it becomes a little bit more coercive, when we start coming at it, at it with an agenda of our own. Yeah. Like yeah, when it all so starts kind of pushing. Yeah. 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 There's so much information and just joy <laughs> that we can have um, through that connection and engagement of, of helping them learn it and yeah. whether we have have that knowledge that we can share with them or whether it's something new for us and we're figuring it out together yeah you know what I mean like that whole it it is the value of of a relationship in learning yeah is vast isn't it and that's what I've loved the most I think about your work <laughs> about what I've been reading and listening to and all the things um so yeah, it's been such a joy to really connect with Emma and other people in my life. And uh, when going back to the beginning, when, when you asked me about like learning to play, that was actually another piece that I had to peel back because it was like, oh, but I shouldn't be directing. I shouldn't be doing this. And sometimes I was even getting on at Marco, like, oh, but you know, like you're directing her too much. I'm like, don't tell her this. And uh, of course that's not helping any relationships. <laughs> um, but that was another layer to peel back uh, of like, you know, like I can connect with her without um directing or being pushy or having my own agenda uh so it's not like either I step away or I have an agenda there is another possibility <laughs> Daniela's experience is just so fascinating isn't it and we're gonna leave it here it was hard to choose just a few clips for this episode if you want to dive deeper, be sure to check out the link in the show notes where you'll find links to all the podcast conversations I've had with teachers turned unschoolers. Have a great day. I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey. And be sure to check out the growing podcast archive. The conversations never go out of date. You can find more information about my books, the Living Joyfully Network online community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit online course at my website, livingjoyfully.ca.